So what I have here is a simple chair or a stool, you can say, that rotates, right, about a central axis. Now, what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to sit on this and without touching the ground, I'm going to try to rotate by 180 degrees. Now, watch. Yeah. So, yeah. That's what I'm on the chair right now. So I'm not going to touch the ground and I'm going to try to rotate. Oh, what? So you can see that it is almost impossible to change your final angle, right? It's impossible, in fact, to rotate by 180 degrees without, without touching the ground or without touching something else. Now, the question is why? Why is this the case? Also, let's, let's look at the age-old question of why when someone tries to spin, right, on their foot, like you, right, if you try to spin on your foot or say a ballerina or a dancer tries to spin and, and when you, once you start spinning, you bring your hands closer to each other, you find that your speed increases. Similarly, in the case of the dancer or the ballerina, when she brings her hands close to each other, her uh, angular velocity increases. Why is that? Uh, another example of uh, this phenomenon is, say, if you take a, a toy which is made of a rod and you have a string that atta attached to it and another mass that's on the other end and you start twirling it, right, in such a way that the string wraps around this rod, you'll find that as the mass comes closer and closer, that is, as the radius of rotation reduces, the speed of the mass increases, that is the angular velocity increases. So why do these things happen? To answer this, we'll have to revisit the definition of angular momentum. Angular momentum, how did we define it? Uh, for that, let's say, let's say I have a point object over here. And let's say it's moving with some acceleration, okay? And at a point in time, it has a velocity and this is that velocity. Now, I want to calculate the angular momentum of this point, point mass, with respect to a point over here. What do I do? So, at that point in time, at that instant in time, I draw a vector from that point, right? And that vector will be my r vector. Then, my angular momentum, or L, is equal to r cross mv. Now, this we already know. Now, let's uh, look at something else. So, we found that in mechanics, that is, translational mechanics, dp by dt was equal to the net external force on a system, right? And also, we've seen till now that most of the laws in rotation also, they remain exactly the same. Uh, the only difference being the variables change to their rotational analogs. For example, when we saw like f is equal to ma, the rotational analog is torque is equal to i alpha, etc. so on and so forth. So that means by the same logic, if dp by dt equals f, then dl by dt should be equal to the torque, right? Uh, let's see if that's the case. So I get L is equal to R cross mv. Then what will dl by dt be? dl by dt will be equal to d by dt of R cross mv. Now, to differentiate this, we had a rule from cross products. So we'll use that. So this is equal to dr by dt cross mv plus r cross m dv by dt. Okay, so we have two terms. Now look at the first term. What is the first term? It's dr by dt cross mv. Now what is dr by dt? dr by dt is nothing but what? v, right? Simple, it's the same velocity vector. So in other words, it's just v cross mv. Now v cross mv is going to be zero because both of them are parallel vectors. So thus whole term will vanish. Let's come to the second term. The second term was r cross m dv by dt. Now, dv by dt is nothing but a, which is the acceleration vector, right? So, that term becomes r cross m a. And what is m a? m a is nothing but the force, the force that's acting on this point mass, right? So, that becomes r cross f. And what is r cross f? We've already learned that r cross f is nothing but the torque acting on this point mass about this point. So, finally, we get that dl by dt equals the torque acting on this point mass. Okay, we saw this for a point mass. What about a rigid body, a big body? 
Now, first of all, what is the angular momentum for such a body that's rotating about a point? We already saw that the angular momentum will be i into omega, right? And both angular momentum and omega are vectors and both of them will be in the same direction. Okay, that is the angular momentum and omega will be in the same direction. Now, if I differentiate the angular momentum in this case, that is if I find dl by dt, what do I get? I get dl by dt equals d, d by dt of i omega. And because i is constant, i will come out. So I get dl by dt equals i into d omega by dt. Now, what is d omega by dt? It's nothing but alpha, right? So I get dl by dt equals i alpha. So now you know what we got. So i alpha is nothing but the net external torque that's being applied on this rigid body. So again, I get dl by dt is, is equal to the torque. So in both cases, both for point mass as well as for rigid body, we find that dl by dt is equal to the torque. So that brings us to a very interesting result. So if the net external torque was zero, then we'll get dl by dt equals zero. Or in other words, the angular momentum will have to be constant. So this basically means that if I have a system of particles, right, and I prove that the net external torque is zero, then I can say without doubt that the initial angular momentum should be equal to the final angular momentum. Now, this is called the principle of conservation of angular momentum. It's very similar to, of course, the principle of conservation of linear momentum, which we saw a few chapters back. But this principle has is, is very important in the sense that it 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 is used in many cases. Like uh, it can be used when we are talking about stars and planets. It can also be used when we are talking about protons and neutrons, etc. So it has very varied cases. So this is a universal law that can be used in both atomic and galactic scales. So now that we know this, we should be able to answer the questions that were posed initially. Like for example, the first one, where I sat on a bar stool and I tried to turn, but I couldn't. Now this one is fairly simple. You actually don't even need conservation of angular momentum. See, the answer is simply because, because I'm a part of the system. So you're looking at the system consists of me plus the chair. But there is no way I can produce a net external torque. Unless, of course, I touch something else, say I touch the ground and I push using the ground or I say touch something else and I push using, say, a table or something like that. Uh, there is no way I can produce a net external torque and therefore, you know, there can be no change in alpha, no th change in theta, etc, etc. Uh, another way, of course, is that because there is no net external torque, we saw that there can be no change in angular momentum. And in it, my initial angular momentum was zero. That is the system, right? The system that consists of me plus the chair. The initial angular momentum was zero. And since there is no external torque, the final angular momentum should also be zero. So irrespective of what I do, I cannot change the angular momentum of the system. So let's take the other examples. Let's take the toy example, the one where there's a shaft and then there's a mass that's spinning around the shaft. Now let's analyze this first. What is the torque or what is the force acting on uh, this system? If you assume that the string plus the mass is a system, then the force is obviously coming from the shaft, right? It's a normal force. But the axis of rotation also passes through the shaft. So therefore, the point of application of this force passes through the axis of rotation, which means the net torque about that axis is going to be zero, right? So because that is true, we can conserve angular momentum around that axis, okay? So let's do this. Let's assume that the mass, it has a mass m and initially it has a radius r1. So when it's spinning, its angular momentum would be i1 omega 1, right? And i1 will be equal to m r1 squared omega 1, okay? Now, after some time, the radius reduces, right? The radius of rotation reduces because the string wraps around, right? And it achieves a different omega. So the second angular momentum, let's say, is i2 omega 2. And since I2 will be equal to m r2 squared omega 2. So from conservation of angular momentum, we'll get m r1 squared omega 1 equals m r2 squared omega 2. Now, since r2 is obviously less than r1, from this we can see that omega 2 has to be greater than omega 1. So this explains why the mass speeds up as the radius reduces. Finally, let's come to the question of the spinning dancer. Now, by now you should be able to answer the question yourself. 
so let's see so let's say there's a dancer and she's spinning so she has some angular momentum initial angular momentum but when she brings her hands close to each other as she spins what she is essentially doing is she is reducing her moment of inertia because more mass is coming closer to the axis of rotation and just like we saw in the previous case there is no net external torque on her when she is doing this so therefore we can conserve angular momentum so initially she had some angular momentum i1 omega 1 Finally, she has angular momentum I2 omega 2, but I2 again is less than I1. So therefore, omega 2 has to be greater than omega 1. And this is exactly why uh, her speed of rotation increases as she brings her arms close to each other. So now that you've understood and digested this, let's, let's test your understanding. Let's see how well you've actually understood this. So let me ask you a question. So let's take the case of the spinning dancer itself. And let's say that as she brings her arms close to each other, her moment of inertia reduces by half. So that basically means I2 is equal to I1 by 2. Okay. Now, how, how will the angular velocity change? So for that, let's just calculate. So we know I1 omega 1 should be equal to I2 omega 2. If I replace it, I get I1 omega 1 should be equal to I1 by 2 into omega 2. So finally, if I rearrange that, I get omega 2 is equal to 2 omega 1. Or in other words, the angular velocity doubles when the moment of inertia reduces by half. Alright? Okay. Cool. So now, let's calculate the kinetic energies. So what is the initial kinetic energy? It is half I1 omega 1 squared. Okay. What is the final kinetic energy? Rotational kinetic energy. It's half I2 omega 2 squared. Now, let me just replace these terms. So the final kinetic energy becomes half I1 by 2 into 2 omega 1 the whole squared. If I calculate that, I find that my final kinetic energy is 2 times the initial kinetic energy. But how is that possible? Because there is no external force that's doing any work on the system, on her, on the dancer, right? But still, her kinetic energy has doubled. Where is this energy coming from? So I'll give you the answer, but before you see that, Pause the video and think about it for a while and try to come up with it yourself. Okay? So, the answer is that she herself is actually doing the work. And the work is being done against a centrifugal force. So, what's happening is that as she's rotating, in her rotating frame of reference, there is a pseudo force or a centrifugal force that's acting outward in all directions continuously. So, when she's bringing her arms in, she is doing work against that centrifugal force, okay? And by using her muscular energy, or you can say her muscular potential energy. So it is that work that is being converted into energy and that manifests itself as an increase in rotational kinetic energy.